So thank you, Gavin, for organizing everything and also for helping to conceptualize this idea. We have this series called Complex Issues, and we've done um, three before. The first was um, for my new book, um, and I did it with Philip Lopate. It was about losing my mother. The second was uh, the, th the second was playwright Lynn Nottage in conversation with David Henry Wong. Um, the idea of the, of the series is that we put two faculty in conversation with each other, and you, when something new comes out, whether it be a book or, in this case, a CD or a film, and then we have people in dialogue and as a way of getting to some difficult issues. Um, and then we had Margot Jefferson, who was in conversation with Trey Ellis around her memoir, Negro Land. And today, really happy um, to have Mia Masaoka and Tom Kalin in conversation about her new CD, uh, Triangle of Resistance, which I have, just happen to have, right here, Four Moons of Pluto. And the Wall Street Journal said it praises for being deeply expressive and hybrid in style. And I think you'll, we're going to play an excerpt for you so you'll get to hear a little bit about it. Let me, um, let me also, before I get to the bios, just read you just a little bit from what I thought were very beautiful, Mia, the line notes for this one. I really love it. I love the whole design of it, actually. It's very beautiful. Um, but let me just read you just in the beginning. On February 19, 1942, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, throwing the lives of over 110,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry into turmoil. This order authorized the U.S. government to remove all Japanese Americans from the West Coast and to imprison them in detention camps. I'm reading this because there are a lot of young people in the room who may not know this history. Um, in German camps, I'm sorry, uh, to, I broke up my own thought here. Imprisoned them in detention camps, in German camps, temporar temporarily assembled centers, and concentration camps across the country. They lost their jobs, businesses, farms, and homes. Young people were forced to leave colleges and universities, disrupting their education. This mass incarceration of innocent men, women, and children, based solely on their race, was a gross violation of their civil and constitutional rights, and unprecedented in modern American history. I think you can see how relevant to what's happening in this country, the CD is so remarkably relevant. In fact, the two articles, um, please sit. The two articles in the New Yorker, just this issue, um, what about the Gucci, the other about photo photography, I think, of the camps, um, that are, are taking up this issue right now. It's become incredibly relevant. And this one more paragraph from, from these notes. In 1981, the Japanese American community spoke out about their losses and pain at the Commission on the Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilian Hearings and demanded redress and reparations. The commission's findings stated that camps were a result of, quote, war hysteria, race prejudice, and a failure of political leadership. So I think you can see that we're in such a moment again. Um, so let me just introduce to you Mia first. Mia Masaoka is assistant professor of professional practice in the sound arts program, and she's temporarily, she's running the program right now, actually, as its director. She is a classically trained musician, composer, and sound artist. Many of her works are large scale and have a specific element of temporality. She's created works for symphony, mixed choirs, multi-channel, fixed media, telematic performances. Um, we could spend the whole day just talking about that. And designed interactive wearable textiles, LED kimono. She has composed pieces using spatialization and has mapped the behavior of plants brain activity and insect movements to sound. She also has performed broadly on the Koto using electronic signal processing and improvisation. And she's performed and recorded with some of the truly great artists, um, Paulino Vera, Stephanie Braxton, Steve Coleman, BJ Iyer, and many others. Tom Kalin is professor in the film program. He is a critically acclaimed filmmaker, director, screenwriter, installation artist, photographer, uh, an activist, I would say. He traverses diverse forms and genres, including narrative features, mixed media installation, and short experimental films. His first feature, Swoon, was awarded the Caligari Prize in Berlin and named one of the top 
100 American Independent Films by the British Film Institute, and Savage Grace, starring Julianne Moore, and, um, he, and Eddie Redmayne, <coughs> premiered in Cannes, Open Zurich, and screened at Sundance, London, and Tribeca, among many others. And it was nominated for a Spirit Award, and it was named one of the top 10 films in 2008, in Art Forum, LA Times, on and on. As a producer, Kaylin's films include I Shot Andy Warhol and Go Fish, and he was a writer of uh, artist Cindy Sherman's feature film, Office Killer, and he was also incredibly relevant for this moment, one of the founding members of um, AIDS, the activist collective Bear Fury. So um, welcome Mia and Tom in the house. Thank you, Carol, so much for the introduction. I think we're going to begin actually by listening to an excerpt of Triangle of Resistance. And um, maybe, Mia, you want to set up what we're going to hear first? Um, <clears throat> yeah, we can start with, the, with track one. Maybe I'm a little bit low and I can s talk a little bit. Um, this was a, uh, not quite an octet, but it was a string quartet combined with a, um, a analog synthesis, myself playing koto, and a percussion, multi-percussionist, and going, well, there was, at different times it was just the string quartet, and at different times it was the string quartet combined with um, this other ensemble and going back and forth between things that were composed and other things that had a structure with improvisation. So there are some um, abrupt aesthetic dislocations as well, and I think that uh, at different times I like to think of things being seamless, and having a long form in terms of slow, <clears throat> slow nuances that evolve, and other times things that are perhaps there's there's faster cuts, there's faster changes in what's happening sonically, and so I think in a sense uh, this represents some of those changes. Um, maybe we can play track one, please. It's Felix back there. He's been our DJ. <coughs> That's the, you can turn it up a little bit, that's like um, the koto and the cello kind of slowly like being quite noisy with the bow and a lot of hard pressure. And the, <clears throat> that's Ben Vita on analog synthesizer, that, that, the, the noise going on there. called the long road this particular piece.
really great musicians. That's Jennifer Choi on violin, Esther No on violin, Alex Waterman on cello, David Wallace on viola. Maybe go to the second track, Felix. Thanks. Um, the, well, I can talk a, for a second. Hold on a second. I'll talk a little bit about the title. It's called Triangle of Resistance, and I think um, it's about my mother's, specifically my mother's experience. She was 13 when she was found that she was that their family had three days to pack everything up in a suitcase and go to parts of home where they had no idea they knew where they were, something was going to happen they had to give up their property all their refrigerators toys books everything but they, they didn't know what was going to happen and so um so actually when they got into these trains they had like the windows down the the, sh the, the blinds down and nobody knew where they were going and it was a journey that was filled with trepidation and it was going to be a long time. And for a little kid, you don't know where you're going and, and what or what's going to happen. And so that was the idea that this is going to be a long road we have ahead of us. Um, and th that was that piece. The next track I'm going to kind of go through because <clears throat> we have limited time. The next one represents a little bit of um, dislocation going from different kinds of perhaps internal in interiority of of emotion of feeling at times excited at times depressed at times frustrated etc um, and the idea of resistance in different situations can be really different things i mean if you're confined and if you're imprisoned what does it mean to resist it might, it might mean just trying to stay functional um keeping your family trying to stay sane I think when my mom was like, once she was in the camp, she was maybe 14 at that time, and there's this article that she wrote for the newsletter, the camp newsletter, and it said, I mean, this is a 13, 14 year old girl talking, but she's saying everybody has to be more civil to each other, and it was this kind of editorial that she was hearing about the adults being impolite to each other, and that they really needed to be civil, and I'm just thinking, you know, that's just incredible, that that's, that was her way of saying, you know, things are breaking down. The structures are breaking down. Civility is breaking down. And we as a community have to keep it together. And um, so the next, the next piece is uh, about, uh, you know, the, the walls were really thin. Um, they didn't really have a system of, like, when she first got detained, they had to go to these stay in the horse stalls because they went to these different assembly centers in California. So my mom went to one, a horse stall in Tanfran, which is in California. And there was like manure on the wall that they had to clean the walls off. And it was very demeaning for them. They had to share, you know, they didn't really have proper bathrooms with proper privacy. And, and, so, and it was, you know, kind of a dignified culture and to have to kind of do those kinds of very, um, be in situations like that was really humiliating to say the least so um but when they did go so there were these temporary horse stalls that they went to and then they went to permanent permanent places for four years in the badlands or different places in utah different places where nobody wanted to live there was sand everywhere the air was bad it was really hot and cold in the winter and so um and those were the where the permanent camps were located and um so, so even in the permanent camps, there was you could hear neighbors going what they were doing all the time, and there wasn't a lot of privacy for people. And also, like the family, people, the, you don't need as a family. The kids all kind of ate together, and then the adults just kind of went to the mess hall at different times. So, the family structure also kind of got broke up that way. But um, so this next part is talking about the the, the paper barracks and, and that situation a little bit too. Thanks, Felix.
Okay, thank you. And I just want to skip to the last part, just quickly, track three, and that's with the string quartet. Um, just the string quartet, and that's kind of like a feeling of somewhat... Go to track three, uh, the last, track three, thanks. And, and in that one, there's a little bit more um, resolution. That, that piece is called Survival. passerby shouted at her, read it good, Jack. She was about to be taken from her home, pulled from her school, and go to a prison camp for four years. I think with horror how she must have felt to experience such hate coming from both government and passerby simultaneously. And so we were talking before the panel started about, obviously, immigration, customs enforcement right now, and the United States is implementing just such an extraction of you know, people from the country and then before that, the Republican regime's implementation or failed attempt to implement a Muslim ban had similar consequences. Um, and I just think it's really powerful in your piece how you chose um, to sort of create a subjective journey through this narrative in these three passages. Um, I wonder if you talk about that. In other words, it's so evocative, this idea of trying to put the listener in the place of being in a confined train with all the shades drawn, um, or the idea of, you know, living with people that you don't know, where there's no privacy and you can hear them clattering through the walls. And you know, we often think of political as a sociological or enormous thing, but in this case, political was really a personal thing. It was a kind of issue of family history, your mother's willingness to talk about this, or later maybe not to tell you this story. So I just wondered if you talk about this idea of how a really personal family story became something um, that intersected with our, our government and our culture and our society in a bigger way. Yeah, I mean, it was my mom, it was also both grandparents on both sides, it was all of my old, my uh, aunts and uncles, and basically it's my personal history that, um, you know, that every now and then I think about. And it was such a different time, I mean, you know, um, resistance now is one thing, resistance then is something else. When the executive not order 9066 came out, for example, Chinese had on the Chinese laundries and the Chinese uh, community had "We are not Japs" in sign the sign, signs on their on their places of business in their homes, so that people would know, you know, we're Chinese. Don't mess with us. And 
There wasn't any support from the NAACP. There was no support from you know, from that from the black community. There was no support from the Jewish community. There was basically zero protest or anybody speaking out. Um, I think there was one representative, I don't know, from a socialist organization in Congress at one point, who said one sentence that was on the record of, of protesting or somehow disagreeing, and there was no discussion, and it was just kind of on the record for that ha one sentence for 30 seconds and the minutes. But basically, there was no, pro nobody, nobody stood up. And the, the generation and the camps, it, it, they were the kids in terms of the, they were like younger people or older people. There wasn't that age group of people in their 20s and 30s that could build a movement or that would really be able to do a more organized kind of resist. So that the older people were speaking Japanese, they were, they were more the immigrants, the younger ones were born in the US and basically still really young and not old enough to really do something in an organized way. So th the generation thing played a, a role too. Um, uh, yeah, but the personal thing is, is huge, of course, because it wasn't that long ago. I mean, that was my mom's generation, you know, and you, you could, it was just, you just needed to be one sixteenth Japanese blood, which is like, you know, great, great, great grandfather, which is a real conceptual idea of what is gender, what is race, these are really constructions that are, can be defined by whoever is in power. And, and, and it's insane to have, if you're this crazy, insane construction amount of blood, then you have to go to the camps. You distinguish in the, the, um, your notes about Issei and Nisei, that if I'm pronouncing it correctly, which is the idea of the first and second generation Japanese, and the idea that the, the great, presumably your grandparents' generation, you know, there was a, a huge curve because the first immigrants couldn't even necessarily own property and were really second class citizens. We're not citizens at all. And then the distinction of you know your parents' generation who were actually American citizens being arrested by their government and locked up, and I just. I wonder if you talk a little bit further about sort of the difference of the perception of this event between those two generations and what it meant. Because I think with all of us in the room, we all have generations of immigration and we think about the legacy of how we think about, you know, my, my father was born in Lithuania and my last name is Kalinowskis. So oh, wow. He butchered it when he came to Chicago because Lugans were not appealing. It was like, you didn't want to be Lithuanian, basically. So I have a very strong sense of that, sense of, um, you know, what it means to be, uh, you know, what, what it means in terms of just citizenship and relationship to being immigrated into a culture. And I wonder if in your own family, do, do you have the perceptions of the difference of those generations? I just found that so intriguing in your notes. Um, yeah, I mean, the generations were huge. Like, my grandfather kind of refused to speak, to learn English. I mean, he lived here, he died in his 90s, and he lived, you know, for, like, the whole time he just either pretended he didn't know any English, or he didn't learn because he, he didn't want to kind of engage with the culture maybe perhaps in that way. And he had so many, they had so many kids and they, they did that for them. And um, he was a, f a strawberry farmer and it, at the time in California, they, the, um, the farmers didn't, didn't have a real strong strawberry way of growing the strawberries, but coming from Japan, they knew how to grow strawberries in this terraced and um, terraced soil and rocky soil and not great soil. So when they came to Japan, to the US, they were able to really, to grow these strawberries and really have these amazing strawberries. And so they really built up this industry. Of, and they weren't, my, my, my grandfather couldn't own land because um, what they were, there was an anti-immigrant um, land law. And um, so he had to re rent it or be a tenant farmer, but he could still ra raise the strawberries. And it was, the internment happened also when the big harvest came. And so it was also this big economic land grab from the Japanese American farmers who were doing, had developed all this very non-fertile land and made it really productive based on the techniques that they knew from Japan. And then at the harvest time, you know, everything got got taken. So the timing of that. But I'm sorry, I, di I digress. No, you're, you're answering the way. I guess it's just to follow up as thinking about also you know, we heard from Carol about the period in the 1980s and the sort of um, challenge to the U.S. government and the demand for, you know, equity to be the recognition of this outrage and um, what had happened. But I'm so intrigued about the period of time after the internment is over, when you are a citizen and you've been declared not a citizen, and then you have to be a citizen again. 
And I wonder just how was that represented in terms of your family? Was there ever a discussion about mm -hmm. the period after the 40s, before you were born, as it's moving towards an area? Is that an area that no one talked about, or how was that handled? Well, yeah, people don't, I mean, one way of like surviving is just to not think about all the bad stuff that's happened to you, because it's so traumatic and you don't want to be depressed all the time. So I, they didn't like to talk about it very much, but they talked about it with me and my sister and brother, I think more than other Japanese American parents did. So we did hear some things, and we also knew that when they did get let out of the camps, they were told, don't go hanging around with each other, and live by each other. You're, for your safety, you should really find go somewhere else. And so a lot of coming back to the communities, it was different too, because where they had lived before, there was a wave of African-American population from the South coming in and filling in industries in the in, during that time, in the early 50s. Uh, after the war, and so those, so they they found different places to live, but also realized that they were told not to live with, around each other because it could pose as a danger to themselves from other people or something. Well, in, in the context of filmmaking, we often think of we talk about narrative a lot, obviously, and we think of um, the image in a film is where it's a retinal thing; it goes through the eye into the mind. Uh -huh. But the way we think about sound often is it's about the body. But sound is the thing, and sound is actually one of the most effective ways to activate the subtext of something, or to activate the unconscious of something. Yeah. There are two realms. There's a conscious realm of story, and then underneath there's this lurking unconscious realm. And I think the most striking part of your piece is that by using sound and making me have an experience of my body, you create a different kind of narrative. You're dealing with narrative in a way that, you know, there's a progression in your piece, and I just wondered if you talk about this idea about the sort of hidden, unconscious elements of how sound works on us, and as a medium, what that means to you. How do you think about that, as a, using that? <coughs> yeah, I mean, there's kind of a prelingual space, maybe, in the brain or something where you, you um, experience sound. First is maybe a response, like if you hear someone screaming, you know, oh, okay, alert, possible danger and you, you check it out and you're, you're not thinking, okay, it could be A, B, and C, it's not entering that part of the brain yet, it's just kind of a response, like a low-level response or something. And so, in a sense, if when there's not a, such a literal uh, connection to a, a word, for example, there could possibly be um, a more abstract, uh, another part of the brain or the emotion, or the body, as you say, yeah, the body, that can, can interpret these things in a kind of um, subtext or something that's not on the conscious level, perhaps. I don't know, I've never quite thought of it that way, but yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting is you give the, you know, the listener an experience, and that's a root to back of this idea of trying to conjure the experience that your mother or your family had of going from something really fearful and then living in a new place, and then in the third passage of the, the piece, some kind of guarded movement out of that. Um, I wondered if you talked just yet, you mentioned this concept of gaban, again, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, um, which is this, uh, a notion of uh, strategy withstanding um, hardship, and that that would really govern or really guide into your thinking of the third passage of survival, and I, I wondered if you just could articulate this um, concept and elucidate it, because I wasn't familiar with it before I got the audience. Um, it's um, well, Goman, it's, a, it's like just, it's kind of realizing you have to get through something and you just have to keep going no matter what. And you can't think, you can't get um, too wrapped up in your own emotions. It's kind of like, it's kind of like uh, just get through it, you know, just do it. Don't, because it's, if you don't, who knows what will happen to you. So you just kind of get through it. I mean, it can be, you know, something like just getting through the day, or it can be something more just getting through a difficult time, or, but, but a way of kind of enduring hardship. It sounds like you're describing something that's both individual and also collective. Is it in a concept? Because in some ways, I think what we're doing now in terms of resistance is, you know, we talked about this before, this idea of, uh, you know, if we all thought that we had to tear down the wall or make political change, it would be impossible for an individual, but a thousand hammers you know, hammering away can make an enormous movement. We're seeing in this um, week when the Congress and Senate is back, all of these people being empowered, all these citizens crowding into town halls and insisting to be heard. And I think it's interesting that's both being individuals being mobilized, but there's also a kind of power in the collective. And 
does Gaman include that idea of surviving both finding your individual fortitude, but also finding strength in numbers? Yeah, totally. I mean, I just read today that, you know, that they're going to, the transgender rights are getting rescinded today, you know, and just for someone who has to grow, who is in that situation and they have to endure their hardships already, and then having to experience probably so much hate from perhaps even their own family and their neighbors, and then also on the government level as well. I mean, it must be, to have to endure that kind of hardship. That's where that kind of thing, you have to just keep going or you can just crumble. Would you talk about the title of the piece, how, how it came to call Triangle of Resistance, and also uh, the relationship of making a, a sound piece and sort of what, what Joe was talking about is the beauty of the liner notes and the, the object itself, what's the process of that? Um, well, you know, I, th I was, I, it was called, I was thinking about resistance and, uh, you know, and this was like, now I hear these words all the time, it's kind of interesting, but at the time, um, it wasn't a part of everyday vocabulary. It's 2013? Yeah, yeah. This is made, and um, even though it just came out recently, yeah. right. And, and there's just, I just thought about the ways that people resist. And there can be, at different times of history, you can resist in a very open way because you can resist in really great ways, like the Women's March, or like these, these ways that are going on in the town halls. And that's really, you know, that's great and it's important, it has to be done. And then how you resist if you're in incarcerated or if you're confined. And it's another kind of resistance that is somehow you have to kind of find your path of how you're gonna resist yourself as an individual with others, of course. And so I was par partially thinking that way. And then these different geometric, these different metrics of resistance form relationships with each other. That's a triangle. Right. Yeah, I was thinking, we were talking a little bit before, there was a piece recently um, in The Guardian talking about just the language of the crisis we're in right now and making the point that, you know, you can't actually be an illegal human. So, you know, if, if you use the concept of, we talk about pedestrians, we never, if a pedestrian, an unruly pedestrian, describe, decides to walk in the middle of the street, we don't call that person an illegal pedestrian. We just call it pedestrian is breaking the rules, or bending the rules. And so this idea of being an illegal immigrant, um, the importance of language in this moment as an act of resistance, brings me, on a personal level, back to things like, it's been forgotten, I think, in the kind of liberal <coughs> of the New York Times, but in the 80s, the New York Times was one of our greatest antagonists during the AIDS crisis because they refused to name things as they were. Basically, they, clean, they clung to things like the idea of being an AIDS carrier, or they you know, tried to um, use the, narrativize the death of people from HIV and AIDS as AIDS victims. And it was a very strong rejection of this, saying that, no, we're people with AIDS, we're humans. And you know, to try to um, claim one's subjectivity and one's identity. Um, and I think, again, it just re re returns me to the idea of different versions of resistance. You're talking early on about um, what, you know, how does your work relate into activism or street activism. But I think that there's many different ways of resistance and the witnessing of this thing on a really granular and personal level. Yeah, I mean, I was just thinking, you know, Gary Okihiro, who's on the faculty here at Columbia, um, had, had just published, has published something, an encyclopedia of Japanese internment, and talks about the pattern of the, the uh, like for the colonies, the American colonies, and bringing indentured servants. And that those indentured servants were eventually, they needed indentured servants, but they were replaced with bondage, you know, confining people and, and you know, going to Africa and bond, and, and getting workers from Africa to work for free. And there's this whole, the history of, of, um, of land rights and, and with Native Americans, I mean, it, and, and the going moving forward to the kinds of activism that you were involved with, with Grand Fury, um, and the differences, and, you know, uh, I, I don't know, it's just overwhelming to think about the kinds of patterns that, along with resistance, there's also this, these attacks by these different power structures you know, uh, going on. Yeah, no, I mean, thinking of the footage of Standing Rock and the burning footage of Standing Rock that we've just seen in the past few days, which is just incredibly devastating. And to think about sort of the weird mirroring of the two things, internment being, you know, people involuntarily being taken from their domestic homes and jammed into this harsh landscape, and the other being Native Americans, you know, being so connected to this land and being a corporation and a government basically ejecting them from the control of that. The, 
Yeah, I mean, my uncle, who was um, part, of, who was a leader of the Japanese American Citizens League, was in some high-level meetings with governments at one point, and there was people. The government was saying, "Well, what do you think? Should we keep the Japanese Americans in the camps like we've done with the Native Americans?" I mean, they were bringing this up as if it was an option. It was an option for them just to keep Japanese Americans in the camps. They were already in the Badlands, and and it, you know, these were like serious discussions. Um, so. Yeah. Uh, I, I'll, I'm going to ask you just a couple more questions and then open to the audience because I'm sure people will have comments or questions. Um, and it's more just about sort of your process. Um, two things. One is why a CD and live performance as opposed to other ways of expressing this thing? Like, could be an installation or could be experiential in a different way. I have my own attitude about that, about sort of like the intimacy of, in, you know, I can listen to your music as I did in this room, but I also have the ability to listen to it in headphones very intimately, very individually. Um, I just wanted to talk about sort of your choice of form when you're composing, when you're making music, when you're thinking about the audience's experience of it. Yeah, I just did a, uh, I just had an installation at the Armory called Vagina Dialogues, and it was 16 chairs that were, that had a different particular frequency that people sat on and the idea was that vaginas are the third ear that they looked like vaginas <laughs> looks like ears and you also kind of listen not just with your ears but you listen with your whole body so I have this idea of the vagina is a third ear and um, the the way that form works for me is you know the internment it's my life story it's, and it's something I don't want to think about all the time and every now and then I revisit and it's, it, I revisit it in, in a different way, usually a different form, because I've, I'm a different person at that point, and the world is different. So um, I've done, you know, a lot of pieces about internment, and probably I'll do a lot more as I, you know, until I'm dead, basically, on and off. Um, and and so form ends up being kind of an aspect of the expression, and pretty malleable. I mean, you know. And sometimes installation, sometimes videos, sometimes live, sometimes fixed media. It's it's not that different from an internal point of inspiration, perhaps. It's a the way you know. It's the way, yeah. how it gets expressed is different. Yeah, I love that answer. Um, and I guess I just I wonder if you ever talked um, with your performers on this of whether they felt individually in performing this music that it itself was an act of resistance. I find it so interesting about thinking about musicians and about, because it's corollary to working with actors, but it's not at all, it's related and different. And I just wonder what the act of performing music means in relationship to what the piece is saying for the performance. So it's something I have no experience because I don't perform music, but I know something about acting and I'm just curious about what that means, what that yeah, feels like. That's an interesting question. It's something I'm learning more about when I did this piece for a symphony. Um, they, first, they really cared about what the piece was about. That one was about um, the, the, the nuclear stuff going on in Japan. And, you know, um, for some reason, they really attached a narrative to their performance in a way that I don't, I, I mentally don't always think that way. So, um, so I, was, I realized it was really helpful to them because symphony players especially, especially um, was, they're kind of just do what they're told on the page. And, so they say, well, why are you asking me to do this weird stuff? And if, it, if there wasn't a narrative attached to it, it would just seem like it's, you know, some kind of, uh, some kind of instructive thing for them to gymnastics, something kind of special on their instruments, some kind of extended 20th century technique that's for mo modernist purposes or postmodernist purposes or you know, exhibiting some kind of fluency of, of expanding your instrument or something like that, rather than and rather than thinking, okay, this is this internal feeling. So I think it's really interesting to think that way because musicians, whether playing they're, whether they're an orchestra or a symphony, whether a, strong, a smaller ensemble or an improvisational situation, they have a different way of relating to the the text that's happening. And, and everyone's an individual too, but I do notice that the musicians, depending on what kind of format they are in, they relate to the, the narrative in a different way. 
No, I think it's so interesting because you have to read music and it's like reading the text of a script and if you don't pay attention to what's underneath it or the subtext, you're just going to read the dialogue lines. But it, for most performers, you have to understand the circumstance or the backstory or what's underneath in order to play it correctly in order to express it. It's intriguing because it's so correlating. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to open it up to the room for questions or comments if there, if there are some. Yes. I have two questions, I think. I'll start with one. And one is, um, you talked about your mother and grandparents telling you stories about the internment and their life stories. But how was the sound passed down to you? Or is this the sound that you imagine from their stories? Is there, but you talked about your mother playing violin, so is there a kind of sound, a transmission of sound? Um, in the transmission of sound, for those of you who didn't hear, is what's the transmission of sound from the, the generation of my mom? And I think um, it would be connected to an association with, it was really windy and sounds of wind. Um, it was dusty, so the breathing, hard to breathe, the dust, the wind combined with the temperature was hot and the summer really cold in the winter. And that there was no privacy, so you heard lots of with the neighbors making love or whatever, arguing next door, um, kids, you know, those kinds of sounds, as well as, uh, you know, I, perhaps, and desperation in the voice, in the human voice, I think is a big thing because when you talk about something so emotional, your voice gets constricted, you kind of, you get a feeling uh, from the sonic data that you're receiving gives you some thought about that. So my second question is, is, the, is your music part of the triangle of existence? Is it one side of the triangle? Um, I don't know. That's, that's interesting mm -hmm. thought. Perhaps. <laughs> I mean, I would like to think that resistance continues through generations and that the transmission of these stories mm -hmm. uh, would mobilize us you know, subsequent generations to continue to resist. Oh, absolutely. Now. Absolutely, yeah. I also think it's interesting how we have, a, I mean, as Americans, we can look at this period of time, and I mean, even within the Republican regime, I refuse to use that person's name <laughs> or any of their names, um, but within the, because they are a regime, and that should be laid on their feet as a regime. Um, the Republican regime, I bet none of them will be willing to defy or speak against what happened, I mean, to, to celebrate the Japanese internment. We all agree, collectively, this is despicable chapter of American history, and we hang our heads in shame about it, and yet look what we're doing to people from, you know, Mexicans and people from Central and, and South America. So the, uh, the lack of perspective around this and the, you know, yeah. the idea that the, lesson, the lessons of the past have to be brought forward and we learned adversely and how incredibly vital this story remains is so obvious. Yeah, know? the anti-Muslim, you know, Shameful. sentiment is just Shameful. so scary. I just can't, yeah. There was a question in the back. Um, I was wondering if when you were making the piece, you gave thought to the concept of time. Um, you mentioned it a couple ways, like I'm thinking that there's a protest tonight at Stonewall about the transgender executive order and how that place is like a natural place to congregate because of the spirit of what that place holds. And you mentioned the generational gap at the camp itself and the fact that these traumatic experiences have been passed down to through the generations. And I'm wondering if you gave like explicit thought to that in the creative process and or what you think of it. Yeah, I mean, I think about that a lot. That um, the, tr the trans going from one generation to another. I mean, as a Japanese American, I heard about all the the Chinese saying, "I'm not a Jap" on their wall. You know, there were famous photos, "I'm not a Jap," and just thinking, "Oh, I hang out with Asian Chinese kids all the time, and we have kind of you know." Um, and, and then in the 60s, which was kind of before my era, there was a real strong movement for Asian, not, not saying Filipino, Thai, Vietnamese, Japanese, Chinese, but really congregating around the term Asian. And it was, it was following the black movement of like self-determination, getting these terms for yourself and not having someone else say, no, you're Negro, you're colored. Because when I was in third grade, my teacher would always say, color this, color that. And I, you know, it, and, and anyways, it was a way of saying, okay, we're going to be called Asian now because 
we want to put that I am not a Jap with the Chinese said behind us because every, we knew as Japanese Americans how painful that was personally, but how hurtful that that was in general, just to be divided like that. So that was a real generational thing that came with the civil rights movement. And, you know, and then I think each generation, even the generation now that Tom was talking about of like the activists now fighting, um, fighting, f you know, fighting for different kinds of rights now is so much faster than it was before, right? Because how long it took the AIDS, for the AIDS activists to happen for that generation, it just took so long to get anything going because the New York, there was no support by the New York Times and by these other forces. But now, people are mobilized in a different way, wouldn't you say? Yeah, no, we were talking before the, this panel about, just as I'm now 55, and so I remember the very first AIDS cases being announced in 1981 in the New York Times, and just thinking it took Reagan until 1987 to even mention the word AIDS aloud, and also how long it took there to be a moment, I mean, as a gay man, an open gay man, it incredibly long time to have a kind of mobilization of people who uh, might have had a different life than me, believing I had a right to exist and supporting me, basically, and I'm, even though scared like the rest of us, I think, about this moment, I'm actually very optimistic about what's happened. We're five weeks into a presidency, and fundamentalist Christian GOP voting people are going to Tennessee demanding that their leaders have, you know, empathy and morality, demanding that the Affordable Care Act be supported, you know, demanding that Muslims be uh, allowed to this their country. And, and, um, so I mean, people are fighting the way and are mobilizing the way that I feel super optimistic about compared to earlier times. And we also talk about this concept of um, people talk all the time about people being afraid that this resistance moment would be burned out. I mean, fought for eight years, five days a week, the whole time of the AIDS crisis, along with thousands of other people. So I'm personally not afraid, but we, there's this musical concept that people within activism have been talking about, is that we're all singing a giant chorus, and if we all had to start the same note and end the same note at the same time, we'd be exhausted. But if he begins a note, and when he stops, she begins a note, and she's tired, she starts, and he starts, and you start, and you start, and you start, the music never stops. And we can all eat meals and drink tea and have baths and pet our dogs and also resist at the same time. Um, I think unfortunately or fortunately resistance is going to be a way that we lead our lives for these next years. I, I would love to believe impeachment is possible, uh, but impeachment may not be possible. So we're going to be doing this on a day-to-day -day basis and the hundreds of thousands of people um, calling um, their, their representatives has been incredibly amazing. I want to encourage people, there are a few resources. I assume people in this room are aware of things like the Indivisible Guide, which is easily findable online, and there are indivisible teachings and meetings all over the country that can be accessed by phone and internet. I'm involved in an organization called Rise and Resist, which meets every Tuesday at the Lesbian, Gay and Lesbian Community Center. There are 9,000 people that are on the Facebook group of it. I encourage you, if you're interested in on Facebook, to look into Rise and Resist. And there's also a national tax, the tax march, which is happening. Already a million people have been mobilized for April 15th. It's basically a demand to Trump, uh, Trump releases, oops, I said that name, <laughs> um, to release taxes um, and to reveal, hopefully, the ties with the um, Russian government. You can find information um, on that at taxmarch.org. There are chapters in almost 100 cities across the country. It's unbelievable. 300,000 people have already RSVP for LA alone. So, and then the Women's March is reprising a women's strike on March 8th. Um, there's a scientist march. Who, who could imagine we're living in a society where scientists are going to Washington and marching? Um, so anyways, there's a lot of things, as I'm sure probably the audience knows, that are happening. Um, I encourage everyone to jump in and dig into them. We have time for a few more questions, if there are any. Yeah. Um, how many tracks are on? Uh, there's four tracks. Three of them are Triangle Resistance, and another one is called Four Moons of Pluto that is based on the strings being divided in octaves and different partials that are located on different areas and finding, finding areas of resonance in an instrument and kind of working, not, not specifically using just intonation, but using different alternative tunings to achieve a particular resonance and using resonance as a center rather than tonality. I don't know if you said reconciliation for redemption, but I, I got a sense of like a closure. 
um, and or healing. And I was interested in whether that was um, whether that was a choice based on a wish that you have for the people listening to it. Um, if that's a guideline, for, like this is where we need to be moving. Um, and whether there was a struggle of like, or should it be left in a space of uh, more tension? Um, you know. hmm. that's a great yeah, that's a really great question. I mean, I think everything comes and goes, and so you have moments of of resolution, like even in a day, in the moment, even if you're incarcerated, you'll have a day that's better than another day. And I think it's more in a micro sense rather than any larger kind of determining factor. That was the word, resolution. <laughs> Regarding your production process, were your musicians together or were your sessions staggered and then you later then mixed your music? Um, it was all together. Yeah. And did you aspire to that or was that the expedient? I, you know, I thought you would say it was later. Oh no, it wasn't layered. It was, it was from a live performance. Mm -hmm. And it's a single continuous take with no editing? Uh, there, was a, there was just minor editing. That's intriguing. So it's kind of a, a documentation of a cathartic interaction. In other words, it's, it's capturing something live. It's not a studio construction. Or it's yeah. capturing a performed thing, a mutually performed thing. Well, yeah, it's, a, it's, from, a it's from a live performance. A live performance, yeah. I see. Where was the live performance? Roulette I see. in Brooklyn. I see. With audience? Yes. One one chef, not a couple of nights, and you choose the best thing. I'm sorry. One occasion, not the compilation of a few performances. Right. A lot of times, um, rehearsals are performed as well. So if you need to like switch in a small section, but I don't think we needed to do that. And other performers have performed the piece. Is there a good <coughs> other iterations or only the people? Oh, I forgot. Perform? Yeah, it's going to be performed at National Sawdust. Thank you. Of course. Yes. Um, March. March 10, or March 11. It's part of uh, the Novus Showcase. And there's going to be a lot of other amazing performers and music going on. National Sadness is in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, what is the experience like as you recount this narrative through sound um, with yourself and other performers? Uh, do you... Are you focused math, math like how is your your is your brain focused mathematically on notes and precision? Do you uh, relive the narrative in the way in that way? What, what's your experience like? I'd say it's fluid. I mean, sometimes like it helps for me to you know if I'm especially if I'm kind of stuck of, with an idea and I want to get new ideas, I kind of go to that narrative space and kind of kind of consciously get there, mentally, psychically, spiritually, and then I kind of get go from there. And sometimes I do that, sometimes I don't, sometimes I do that unconsciously, sometimes not. So it really kind of has its own path. Time for one last question, if there is one. Okay. One minute. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Tom. Thank you everyone for coming out. Thank you.